Good evening, everyone. We're back uh, and live at Future Summit. We're super excited to uh, have you all with us. It's an evening, um, at least in Bucharest. I know some of you come from afar. We had uh, in the previous session people from Colombia to the US um, all the way to Russia, uh, which is a very exciting uh, place to be, as I've heard. Now, um, we have a special session called Tech for Social Good. Uh, that is going to be moderated by Alina Borlaku, who's the executive director of the Romanian business leaders. But before I actually hand her over, um, I just want to tell you briefly what happened um, today. So what happened today in, in Future Summit is that uh, we had a, um, a two great uh, beginnings, uh, Introduction to Sustainability and Introduction to Foresight, um, part one um, of these online classes, then a special... Um, a session, a really special session with Liam Young um, uh, called Planet City and the Return of Global Wilderness, where, where um, Liam presented how he sees the world uh, as a city in 2050. Uh, we talked about the metaverse, of course, with Adrian Postevuka. Uh, and before that, we had a, a chat on uh, decentralized futures. Uh, what happens, uh, for example, tomorrow is that we talk a lot about sustainability from sustainable investment to sustainable business making and sustainable finance. But also we go to Cambridge to talk about genomic revolutions and what happens from this perspective um, and how assistive technology uh, can actually support those that don't see the future like we do in Tech for Blind. Now, coming back to this session, um, thank you again, Alina, for taking the, the time. Um, and the energy, um, and I'm going to retire. Uh, retire is a bad word, no? I'm not going to retire yet, but I will uh, uh, be off a bit, and uh, I wish you a pleasant, useful, uh, and challenging conversation in the next minutes. Thank you very much, Ciprian. Uh, have a very nice rest, a very well-deserved uh, rest. What an amazing first day of uh, Future Summit with uh, a lot of interesting topics. And we've reached the last session of the day. Uh, no pressure. I think everyone is in a, now uh, in the right moment to, to watch us. And I'm uh, super happy that uh, you put this uh, topic on the agenda of Future Summit. I think we are living very interesting times, very challenging times. And these things uh, put together technology and good. Uh, they are an important subject to, to discuss and actually tonight this is what uh, we are going to do. We are going to discuss with our amazing guests uh, how do, you, do we create a symbiosis be between these two areas in order to tackle some of the most important uh, societal challenges. So I have uh, together with me to discuss about technology and good uh, four amazing speakers that I would like to shortly introduce. Uh, there are a lot of things to say about each of them, and uh, because uh, we have limited time, I will only make a short introduction, and afterwards I encourage you to, to search them, uh, to Google them, to stalk them on social media to see the amazing things they are uh, doing. I will start uh, with Olivia, with, uh, because I'm very happy to see her. I don't see her often because all the time she's doing good. Uh, by using tech, for example. Uh, Olivia is the co-founder and chief operations officer of Code for Romania, which I think is uh, becoming one of the most uh, important NGOs in Romania. And uh, they are a group of enthusiast uh, people who love to challenge uh, uh, the status quo and to come up with digital solutions to societal issues. Uh, next, I will go to Stefan. Stefan Yarka is the co-founder of Xvision, which is a company that uses uh, machine learning algorithms to analyze digital X-rays in order to assist doctors in interpreting them. So we are also talking about health tonight, and I think uh, it's a very important uh, topic during a pandemic. Uh, Sebastian Kokinescu is uh, the founder and CEO of, of Tailpad. Telpat is actually a technology company that uh, adds transparency to supply chains by using public uh, blockchains. A lot of words that I don't understand, Sebastian, but I'm pretty sure you will uh, uh, explain us what uh, all these things are about. 
And last but not least, uh, Radu Mozok, uh, who is the executive director of another well-known organization in Romania, which is called TechSoup. Uh, TechSoup is an NGO that believes technology can contribute to fostering a more educated, open and democratic Romania. Therefore, they make to make uh, they work to make technology available, open and familiar to change makers in our society. So very few words about you. Uh, we will find out more. And because we have limited time, I, I was thinking of some questions, but also I would like you to address topics that you think are important for our discussion today. And because I'm very pragmatic, I would like for everyone to start from the same definition, let's say, of what is tech for social good. And uh, while uh, preparing this session, I was doing some research and I found a very cool report on tech for social good. Uh, and I would like just to, to read a few lines. Uh, it's from Tech Nation and the report says like this, tech for social good is emerging globally and it's mobilizing a framework for articulating the values, behaviors and attitude that describe a focus on social impact. The outcome is more important than the mechanism. They include impact on the environment, communities, health, education, transport, and others. Technology for social good can provide mechanisms for people to access or use technology in an open, cost-efficient, and sustainable way. And because two of the organizations that we have tonight with us have tech for social good in their vision and mission, I will ask, uh, first of all, Olivia and then Radu to tell us what they understand. What is so tech for social good? How these two concepts come together? So, Olivia, please be the first one to open the conversation. <laughs> first of all, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And it's really great to be here on a Monday evening. Kind of gives a different energy for the rest of the week. Um, to keep it very short and to make the most of our time, uh, we actually do have a, a program called Tech for Social Good and Code for Romania. Uh, and I think the definition you just uh, you just read to us was quite uh, encompassing. Uh, we're looking at Tech for Social Good both to address social issues and civic issues and also uh, public policy issues through technology, trying to bring it to a, to a better resolution for all of us. And we're also looking at the healthy kind of technology that aside from being a means to an end in order to build a business, for example, in the commercial sector, you also think of the impact that technology will have on the environment that you reside in. So there are there are two layers that need to go together quite well. Um, the commercial side of it, which needs to also focus on giving back to the community and also helping the public sector grow at the same time with the private one. And also looking at as um, actually solving social issues through the power of uh, technology. I'm gonna pass it uh, on to, to Radu further. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, <laughs> um... It's a tall order following the definition of, of a tech nation. I'll, I'll be more, uh, I'll try to be more uh, down to earth. Um, not that I disagree with the, with the conceptual level and I, I fully subscribe to it. Um, in my, in our line of work at, uh, at TechSoup, we regard ourselves as a, you know, a capacity builder and the provider of technology and uh, learning resources for the, I like, I, I like very much to say this, for the average NGO worker. So in, uh, in my view, uh, the, big, you know, the big battles, the, the big systemic changes are won when you have that, you know, the, the Gauss bell, the, the 80%, the big middle, when you have them reasonably endowed with the tools and knowledge they need in order to work productively and deliver on their mission. Of course, I'm all excited about, you know, the outliers, the extremes, the, the, the experiments and the cutting edge technology. Um, but I'm also familiar with the, with the stats on civil society. Globally, globally, the average nonprofit is 3.5%. So we're talking little teams and their average IT spending per year is $3,000. May sound a lot, you know, when you first hear it, but this, that's 
hardware, software, licensing, subscriptions, IT support in case you need to pay for it. So it's actually very little. So just to put it in, in a nutshell, we're looking at some of the most intricate problems humanity faces, you know, social, environmental, uh, you name it, health, education. And globally, people are looking towards nonprofit and NGOs because they go sometimes in areas where nobody else goes. Yes. But we're, you're looking at an army of you know, do-gooders and volunteers who are still generally very poorly equipped in, ter in terms of, of tech tools and knowledge. So to me, to come back to your question, tech for social good is bringing the majority of these NGO workers to a decent level of efficiency of productivity. And Thank then we can experiment. <laughs> Thank you, Radu. I think we at least have two definitions, a macro and a micro one, and you already tackled the implementation part, which I think it will be one of the subjects tonight. Like we have the framework, we have the concept, but how does the implementation work? And before going further, I would like also to, to hear the entrepreneurial uh, perspective on what is tech for social good from uh, our two guests that are... Um, uh, acting in this uh, entrepreneurial area of tech and why not tech uh, alone why not business for profit and why did you in, uh, also acquire this component of good doing good having social impact in your businesses and i'll go to uh, to stefan because it, i think x vision is a project that we need uh, a lot in these times when the medical system is under pressure and, but the question is, how come that an entrepreneur in a tech sector uh, tries to incorporate the good part, the achieving social impact in his work? What's, what's the reason behind? Yeah, thank you. So uh, at the end of the day, a business is a business. So you, you still have to generate profit and you still have to look uh, into that side of things, even if you're trying to adapt it for, for social good. Um, but to us, uh, it kind of starts from the story of our team. We were four co-founders. We met each other in, in college uh, a couple of years ago, now it's seven years ago. And actually, we started working on multiple startup ideas, but we really wanted to make something that we felt helped. I, I know it's a cliche, but we, we wanted to make something that helped because then we could stay motivated on, on working for it on a longer term. Um, this is kind of how we got to working in healthcare uh, because we had no prior experience. We were just computer scientists. Um, and also for us, I guess it's pretty interesting the fact that in healthcare, we feel like it, it's a field where there's a lot of uh, technology backwardness. So fintech is extremely forward right now, crypto, uh, so on and so forth. Um, other sectors, uh, warehouse management is extremely uh, tech savvy as well. Healthcare, for example, is, is one of the few domains that is still kind of obsolete at, at the moment. Um, and we felt like we could really uh, bring technology, uh, bring it up to date, try to deploy it commercially, which is pretty difficult to do. Uh, it's not just building a simple project. You have to also make it work as a business. Because as, as, as I said at the beginning, everything is a business at the end of the day. Um, but you also have this component of, of helping people uh, because at the end of the day, it's all about the patient. Uh, even if you're helping doctors, working better, working faster, working more precise, it's about the patient and, and delivering better health care uh, to more people. Um, so I think it's, it's a pretty interesting thing to work on. I, I do enjoy working on it every day. That, that's amazing because you do have the skills from uh, from this very digital part and you are taking it to uh, in front of a societal need. And I, I want to go also to, to Sebastian. Uh, hello. 
I, I, I had to read a lot of what, what you are doing in order to understand the questions that I'm supposed to, to, <laughs> to answer, to give to you. And I wa also want to ask about the philosophy behind your business and how does the technology and good come together in the things you, uh, that you are doing. And also, I know that uh, last year you offered uh, your services, your company services for free for the companies that uh, needed to uh, check about their supply chains, which is also uh, a way of having uh, impact and helping when, uh, when this is needed. So tell us a little bit about the philosophy behind your business and how do these two components come together? Thank you for having me tonight, first of all. And uh, I'm, I'd like to start by saying that the whole company was started based on my personal uh, mission statement, which is to positively impact as many people as possible. So the company in itself was not uh, started with the money in mind. However, money or business and uh, goods, doing goods are not mutually, mutually exclusive. And I think when you try to positively impact the lives as as many people as possible, uh, money probably uh, at some point will uh, follow along the way. And uh, that being said, we chose to positively impact the world by somehow upgrading the existing systems within supply chains, as you already mentioned. And um, yes, we did offer our services for free uh, for all the companies that were affected by COVID-19 last year. But that's just a small part of our, uh, as you said, our philosophy, which is to actually positively impact as many people as possible. And um, we started also, uh, uh, we, we have had another uh, project and we still have it ongoing, which is called SEVA, SEVA.green, which is a traceability app for donations, clothing item donations, which is again matching the, the, right, uh, uh, the right user, not the right users, the, the ones that are donating clothing items to those that actually need them and uh, some other um, uh, there are some other actions that we are doing on this front and if we take a step back or um, we think about social good in general and technology i think as i said they are not uh, mutually exclusive business is actually uh, helping um, the society move forward if you look at uh, elon musk for instance he wants to send us to mars and he's doing it also for the sake of the humanity uh, if we look at our environment we'll see that on the political agendas of all uh, major nations there's technology for saving the world so i i can't think of another way of doing business unless you do have a social good or social impacts in mind. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. I think this is an emerging trend that we are seeing globally. But before going to the, the global picture, I would like to come back to Romania a little bit, because this is the, the community that we are all working on right now. And I would like to ask uh, Olivia again, what are the opportunities that you are facing at this moment in time? Because we, we know we have a lot of problems, starting from education to health to transportation, you name it. So, of course, we have opportunities, but for sure, we also have a lot of challenges. And I know that Code for Romania developed a lot of important projects last year and this year also. Uh, in connection with public authorities, and I hope we have time to tackle this as a sub, uh, separate subject. So I would like to, from your perspective, what are, I don't know, one to three opportunities that we are facing because of this global and local context, and what are the main challenges that you face as an NGO that try to educate people and try to uh, 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 gather together as many stakeholders to understand the importance of putting some technology into doing uh, social good? Um, I think the, uh, the pandemic, both on a global and a local context, uh, have actually helped us understand where we're at, actually, in terms of digital um, uh, literacy and what are the resources we know how to handle and how to work with. 
Um, so from, from a research perspective, this has been an experience that has taught us a lot. Uh, it's shown us how our teachers are handling uh, online education. It showed, it showed us how public institutions can handle this kind of situations. Um, it has taught us a lot about how we communicate when the only channel we have available is online and we don't have the usual means of communications. And for the NGO sector, um, it kind of showed uh, how unprepared we are, unfortunately, but also help them understand they need to prioritize a bit this part of understanding how technology can actually help them, both in, on an internal level, as Radu was saying earlier, they need to be at the point where they can actually work with some tools to become more efficient, but also to increase their impact in working with their beneficiaries. So um, we're looking at a moment when we kind of have a sort of a diagram and um, um, a bigger picture of where we're at as a country in terms of our digital capacity at this moment in time. And what, what we also uh, see as an opportunity at this moment is that we kind of got to a point in which sort of everybody was facing the same issue. So we're all facing the same problem, the same kind of level of threat. So I do feel that cooperation and collaboration has quite uh, started to develop in, uh, in the past uh, year. Maybe I'm uh, very optimistic about it, but we actually have seen uh, open doors and conversations starting to happen in order to work together towards getting out of this, uh, this uh, very unfortunate pandemic we're going through. So we also have another opportunity at this moment um, in the public uh, space, but you, I'm not going to dive into deep because you said we're going to tackle this later. Uh, in terms of the funds that are coming in for the public sector and all the digital reform we're supposed to be doing. So the national plan, everything that has been approved already by the European Union. Um, we have to be very careful and it is our role as civil society and as watchdogs, so to say, uh, it's our role to understand, follow and monitor and also pull an alarm system whenever the, whenever we see that these funds are not properly used to actually get to the point where we're not going to be so vulnerable in case another disaster uh, is coming our way. And we must not ignore it. Well, there's an earthquake coming our way. I don't want to bring the gloom towards this uh, call and this the conversation we're having, but uh, it's a reality. We need to be better prepared. Um, there are many opportunities also um, as we now are at the point where we don't fear technology so much anymore. We've learned to live with it in our house, in our kitchens, in our bedrooms for a whole year and a half, almost two years. We've started to understand that it's not just full of dangers, full of security threats, full of phishing, full of a lot of things that we used to fear. We've noticed that it can actually be friendly and help us get in touch, communicate, develop new ways of, um, of gathering funds for our NGOs, for example, and so on and so forth. So I think we, we're at a point where we're tired, we're exhausted from all the things we're going through. Uh, everything has been new and hard at the same time, but we're at a point when we understand where we understand that we actually have an alley in, in, in an ally, uh, a good alliance with technology. And this can, can get us to a point where we can actually become way more uh, fluid and efficient in our work. So from my perspective, it's quite an optimistic future that we're, we're looking at. And we hope to be there to support every single NGO and every single public institution that actually needs help in, um, in growing their capacity and building the first layers of digital infrastructure. Because unfortunately, we are there still. We are still at the point where in Romania, we build our infrastructure before we start putting modules on top of it and going into the lovely directions that our um, conversation uh, partners are talking about in terms of, uh, I don't know, uh, medical help and so on and so forth. Thank you, Olivia. I, I also know that uh, Radu is interacting with a lot of uh, NGOs and organizations and they are also trying to bring them to the first layer of uh, digital infrastructure, as you as you mentioned. So, Radu, I, I have the same question for you from these kind of interactions that you are having daily with different change makers, how you call them on your website. Uh, what are the one to three opportunities that you see? at this point uh, when we talk about tech for social good and what are some threats or maybe some challenges that you see maybe you or other organizations that you are working with are facing? Uh, to put it in very bluntly, the COVID 
has been this sort of mixed blessing because we were put thousands of Romanian nonprofits were put in the very simple situation sink or swim uh, like I'm sure it happened in the for-profit sector and even in the public sector in, in many instances but for non-profits it was very very you know in your face very sweet and short and brutal and true either you we reinvented our workflows the way we reached out to to our uh, target populations to the communities we serve uh, either we quickly reinvented and you know thinking on your feet trying to figure out what what is essential and what is not or you uh, and i do know unfortunately of organizations that went belly up uh, because of an over reliance on the traditional mode where everybody comes to the office and guess what they had a server and they were keeping stuff on an on-premise server in 2020 but hey you know technology is a tool and it can it can never be better than the people who are managing and you know putting it to use so uh, it it reshaped our uh, in most cases, it reshaped our understanding of work. That's what is that is what we do, and in that aspect, you know, for for profit or non for profit, it doesn't. It, it's not that different. We're still talking about modern organizations who employ knowledge workers. I mean, yes, you will find some NGOs that do physical, actual physical work, but in the vast majority, we're talking about knowledge workers, about people who don't simply execute tasks and that work with digital resources and that handle data. Um, I mean, one of the blessings has also been the fact that the, the donor ecosystem, let's call it like, I'm, let, let's be gentle, let's call it ecosystem, although there isn't much of an ecosystem in Romania, but the few institutional donors that are here and also companies and also individual donors being faced with the same problems themselves at home suddenly were able to understand to, to understand that ngos were facing the same need i mean it's it's a very i know it's a very primitive and, and uh, you know in a way sad form of understanding you don't believe the other one because it you haven't experimented it yourself now when we were all in the same boat we've seen let's say more uh, more understanding from donors uh, for more willingness to cover costs, tech costs. And I'm talking here not only the classical, you know, I need a new laptop or I need a new scanner. I'm talking platforms, infrastructure, and software delivered as a service. Because again, this is 2021, which until the pandemic, in many cases, would have been unheard of. To go to a donor and, and uh, you know file in a financial report an invoice from i just say it i don't know google or uh, amazon web services you know build somewhere in ireland and that would have been you know and, and you wouldn't get past the 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 financial officer who would check your your report and suddenly this became a must yes i need to have that in because nobody else is providing that service and in many cases, these companies are providing these services with a discount for non-profits. Maybe we'll get into that. So again, to put it in a nutshell, it was think or swim. And uh, swim or, <laughs> or sink. And we saw more willingness and more understanding from the, you know, the money people to support costs that are, in my opinion, absolutely normal and necessary in 2021. The costs that the modern organizations run. Mm -hmm. So we we develop some other way of uh, ways of looking at the problem. For example, also the relationship with our stakeholders changed because also their companies change and when we are talking about donors also the companies of the donors were facing uh, challenges to to go more digital because everyone was working from home and all the, the entire business environment change but also i i agree with you that this uh, 
this challenge that we face made us to reconsider a lot of things. But this is, I think this is more the active than proactive. So what can we do to start being proactive in coming together and educating each other, not only extinguishing fires like I like to, to express? So it, I, I took too long, but I'll just a quick answer. Not going to happen very soon. I'm sorry to, to, to rain on, on, on our parade here. Non-profit people are, by definition, not necessarily reactive, but they chase other targets. They don't have, uh, let's say, the digital infrastructure and their own operations in mind. They don't put it first. You won't see many chief operation officers in non-profits. Usually you have somebody who's managing the organization and you know, doing everything from finance to fundraising to HR and what I call you know, field workers, field hands, program coordinators, fundraisers, whatever. So um, you won't see, except, you know, except for some cases, we don't usually have the luxury to, to think about this. And we're also not... Uh, I don't think we're, we're exposed enough to successful role models of, you know, of digital transformation. Having a, a chief information officer of, or a chief technical officer or somebody who comes with a vision and says, look, we need to rehaul our entire organization and put cloud first, let's say, or put data first. That's a luxury we don't often have but also we don't have the, the model, you know? And if you cannot imagine it, you don't bring yourself to, you know, proactively going about it because you'll get carried away with your daily businesses. So if you want, I'll put a, a positive note in the end. I think a sort of a, 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 a bridging this gap between the for-profit sector and the IT and industry and the non-profit world, sometimes, people advance by imitation just by reducing the social distance between us and entrepreneurs like our colleagues here can sometimes fire up the imagination and you can say hey why don't i try i don't know blockchain in my organization i don't know what it is but i'll talk to this guy okay i'll stop here <laughs> uh yes i was thinking that most of the time we see each other like being in two different worlds no this this is also my perspective i look at people working in tech or with tech and i'm amazed by their work and like i don't understand anything i would like to bring this to my, my organization but i don't know how so i would i will go to the tech entrepreneurs which are doing tech for good and i will ask uh, sebastian first how how can we create these bridges how can we create more synergies between the people working in NGOs that uh, like Radu's, like mine, like Olivia's and people like you who have the resources, the skills and all the know-how to, to keep up with the technological trends and how can we create bridges between us? I think it's a very important because tech for social good, it's a global framework. It's something that benefits the entire society, not only our area of expertise or our area of interventions. So how do we create symbiosis? Tech and social good uh, yeah. equals love, you know? <laughs> well, this is already happening. So th this is the good news. Uh, you see right now, what we are doing right now is actually a good example of this already happening. What's doing Ciprian with the... Uh, Future Summit and uh, all the other uh, events and conferences and activities that he's doing. And uh, you see this happening not only in Romania, but also worldwide. So uh, a lot of companies pledged to become uh, B Corp companies that are more uh, uh, aware of uh, doing social good and uh, carbon free and so on. So I think this um, discussion already started. A few years ago, it's getting more active because uh, maybe you've seen at COP26, uh, the narrative of saving the world is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And also the Gen Z, the uh, our kids are more and more preoccupied and uh, they focused a lot on uh, uh, 
climate change and on saving the planet. So because this is happening, a new wave of entrepreneurs, of technology entrepreneurs are coming that are already accustomed to tackling these kind of problems. And uh, how do we bridge the gap between uh, people that are working in NGOs and are doing social good and entrepreneurs? I think the gap is narrowing day by day and it's a generational gap that is filling here. And the people that are coming after us, let's say the new generations, are more and more aware of the social good component and um, what can we do to tackle the problem right now i think we uh, we we can we can uh, attack it in two ways so one is from the entrepreneur's point of view uh, and you can see what's happening in all uh, most most of the uh, accelerators y combinators tech stars and so on they do have a social good component they do have cohorts that are more um, into saving the planet. And on the other side, on in NGOs, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, SEVA, the project with the clothing item donations that we are doing for Mini Pre, a fashion retailer in Romania. Well, this is another example of, um, they're not an NGO, but they're into social good. And they actually came to us and said, hey, you're doing something amazing on the supply chain using blockchain. Maybe we can use the same tech and uh, we immediately hit it off. So I think on both sides, things are already happening. As I mentioned, also this event is part of this uh, uh, this uh, spark that already started. Uh, but we could j just open our minds more and be more proactive, not to wait. So the entrepreneurs should not wait uh, for good to happen on its own and the ngos should not wait for technology to become uh, widely available they could uh, actively search for entrepreneurs or for technology partners to fulfill actually the same goal which is to live a better world for our children right I hope so. I hope this is uh, the thing that we all have in mind. And I will ask uh, Stefan the, the same question, because uh, working with the medical system, uh, I'm sure you, you've seen a lot of things and uh, you had to work a lot to put these worlds together. How was it? Was it difficult to, I don't know, to convince doctors, for example, to use your technology or to incorporate it in their daily, daily job? Okay, I'll, I'll short, shortly answer this question and I'll go back to the NGO part afterwards. So um, I guess it does depend on uh, the doctors themselves and then it does depend on when we were with the solution because at the beginning um, we found it pretty hard to convince anyone, even young doctors, that this is something that can actually work. Actually, at the beginning it didn't really work. So uh, it was pretty hard to do it uh, because... It, it was a very new market. People have heard about it um, and big, big radiology co conferences, but they didn't really get to try the solutions. They didn't really believe in it. Um, so at the beginning, it was pretty hard. Uh, when we managed to get a first few early adopters, um, they weren't necessarily young. Uh, for example, Professor Brzezhtiano is a well-known professor uh, in, in the Romanian radiology community. He was uh, extremely supportive of us at the beginning but it does depend on the type of person to identify those early adopters. And then you try to quantify as much as possible what you have with them. You try to iterate on your product, get feedback, make it better. Um, and slowly you are going to be able to get to more and more people and thus your name is going to be more well known in the radiological communities uh, or the communities that you're working on uh, in, in your market. And this is what happened with Exhibition. Now, I think it's much easier for us to go into a new hospital and just cite all the other reference sites that we have uh, and, and get the software implemented at least for a trial. Um, so it does get easier <laughs> when if, if you manage to iterate and grow your network. Um, and just to get back on the NGO side of things, um, and I, I like to kind of touch on what Sebastian said because my opinion is very similar to his, but um, I would phrase it differently. I think that there's not enough collaboration between NGOs and startups, and this is a problem of mainly visibility. Um, I think that not enough 
NGO people are going to startup events and not enough startup people are going to NGO events. Uh, so there's just a visibility gap between them. I, I, I know that you can search specifically for what NGOs do, but I think that a way or some sort of, such, such as this event, some, some sort of other events or other, I don't know, platforms, ways um, to make startup services and NGO services discoverable to one another would be a great solution to this problem. Uh, yeah. I was making mea culpa while you were talking because I was taking a look at myself and I was like, sometimes I'm so immersed in the daily things that I have to do in the, in the NGO that I don't even have the mental space to think that, hey, maybe I can talk with someone who has a solution for me or who can redesign together with me this process in order not to take uh, 10 hours to finish something, but one hour to make it more, more agile. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's also about the, the, the rhythm that we all have at this point. And everyone is trying to do as much as they can, as best as they can. And I think we need this kind of environment where we come together, as you said, in this kind of events that uh, are uh, uh, for all both NGOs and the tech sector, entrepreneurs, social society, academic, academia, etc. Also, I do believe that when you talk about social good, it's not only about NGOs and it's also about public authorities. And that's why I want to go back to Olivia and to ask her, OK, I know it's I think it's a it's an assumption. I think it's difficult to to convince public authorities of the benefits of tech in handling a lot of uh, uh, problems. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the best practices, that the things that work, the things that can be an example for others to come to you and say, hey, I have this problem. I know you have the solution. Let's work together. So please share a little bit of uh, your experience in that. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, it's been quite um, quite challenging in the past five years to work with public institutions uh, from two perspectives. First of all, we have a very um, human centric, but not in the good way kind of uh, structure in the public area, which means if you don't have a direct conversation with the leader of a ministry or any kind of other agency, uh, nothing's going to happen. So it's uh, from that perspective, the human centric uh, concept has been understood a bit different here in Romania. So it's been it's been quite uh, quite a challenge. It's like Groundhog Day a lot of the times because you have like another and another and another um, uh, leader in a in a ministry and you have to start all over again to implement a project. Um, however, there is uh, quite a bit of um, open mindedness more these years in the past two years than in the other ones because um, we've actually managed to start talking with the people who are doing the actual work. So when you're going and um, having a conversation with the people who are actually implementing all the things that they need to um, to implement in terms of strategy and doing actual uh, physical things or online things in their respective field of work, it's a different kind of conversation. You actually get to understand what are their direct needs. And for them, you kind of co-interest them because for the first time ever, somebody is coming and asking the secretary, OK, what's your issue? Or the lady who is actually handing out papers uh, at the um, uh, local city hall. Uh, so in talking to these people, you actually get them on board and they start pushing uh, for some change from inside the institution. So from that perspective, it's actually great. Second, uh, and this is where we are kind of lagging, and this is one of the main pillars that we're working on currently in pushing for a set of standards, delivery standards for public software, um, and ensuring that uh, they follow the global trends in terms of accessibility, in terms of usability, and so on and so forth. So um, from that perspective, these are things that can be solved with a simple uh, a simple piece of legislation that can be put out there by pretty much uh, anybody with enough uh, with enough attributions in uh, in their job description however um we we still are at a level of digital literacy that does not allow us that does not allow all of us to see the necessity of this at this moment in time so um i was also listening to everybody uh, before me and i would also like to point out that 
while there's a need for communication and getting startups and businesses together with NGOs, um, we also need to sort of find the common language between them because, uh, for example, all these operations like efficiency of process, blockchain, and so on and so forth, these are all terms that for NGOs are completely foreign. They still are. So um, we need to actually figure out a way to also provide more education in terms of digital literacy to NGOs and to the public sector in order for them to understand exactly what they need. Because at this point in time, everybody's like, okay, it's great, we should all have technology, we should do online stuff. But if you ask them what stuff, they're not really particular in saying exactly what they need because they still do not uh, do not understand how to identify their specific uh, issues and how technology can come in and, and actually help them. They fear it because they associate it. And the public institutions still fear it because they put an equal sign between open data, transparency, uh, online, security breaches, and so on and so forth. And they prefer not to use it just so that they don't actually uh, take any kind of risks. But in, uh, it's our job as uh, NGOs, and especially the ones that are working in the, in the technology area, to actually point out and start pushing for uh, sustainable, healthy choices in terms of, of developing technology in the future for public institutions. And also, I, I really appreciated the fact that I've seen quite a lot of uh, high-skilled professionals going into uh, the government or into local city halls and starting to work, be it pro bono or in a paid job, to actually help them provide better uh, tech services in the future for citizens. So from that perspective, I think that in five years from now, and again, I'm probably the most optimistic person on this call, <laughs> in five years or 10 years from now, we're actually going to look at actual, um, um, see uh, this level of CX in designing public uh, online public services and actually putting the citizen right in the middle of the, uh, uh, right in the middle of technology and bridging this gap between people and uh, and the services. Thank you. And I'm also with you the, with the optimistic part. And I hope by the end, we will <laughs> get everyone into the realistic, optimistic part. Uh, before going to the future and how the future looks like, because, of course, this is the main topic of the entire uh, event. Uh, I think you pinpoint something very important because I'm, I'm very in love with this concept of blind spots. and all the time we have some blind spots and I'm sure we have some blind spots also when it comes to technology and social good coming together. And you said something about common language and digital literacy. And I want to ask uh, Sebastian uh, if he sees other blind spots, some things that are not in plain view when we are discussing about technology and social good, something that we should consider like having a different perspective on things. Well, I think we should consider the 2.5 billion people that are unbanked right now. And of course, I'm biased when I talk about blockchain because that's my field and that's my passion and that's my actual life. And um, that's, that's a huge topic that we could focus on, the 2.5 billion people that are unbanked. And uh, I'm not saying that the blockchain will uh, automatically save uh, or um, solve the problem for all these people. I'm just saying that we should look more careful at these solutions, as at these alternative means of using technology to uh, empower those that are not bankable, actually, and uh, banks are not uh, able to help them. Uh, another thing that I would look at, of course, uh, would be supply chains. So um, let me give you an, an example so that you can have a more clear image on this. 40% uh, of the fish that ends up in the, uh, our stores and we eat it uh, does not have a proven provenance um, certificate or we can't really know and it, where, where does it come from. Uh, and this is actually impacting a lot of people because people get ill. Um, more than 600 million people fell ill, fell, fell ill last year because of um, eating contaminated foods. And this may be solved by technology, by an extra layer of trust or of transparency that, of course, may use blockchain. And this is what we are doing. But that's not the point. The point is that the main topics that should be on our, all of our heads right now would be safety and security as 
people, as persons, and uh, climate change. So these are the most important things that we are confronted with right now. And then uh, comes the other. The, the, there are other threats such as cyber crime or cyber war or fake news. And that's a huge topic that we should be focused on. But not to move from from our um, from our main topic, which is uh, tech for good. Uh, I would say that. Um, as long as we know that technology in itself is not going to solve our problems, but the use of technology will somehow uh, help us tackle the problems that we are having right now, then we are on the uh, a right path on a good way. On a tailpath, no? <laughs> <laughs> the path um, from tailpath, right. <laughs> I will also invite uh, Stefane Radu if they see other blind. It's not like you can see the blind spot, but if we can take a look at a little bit different at, uh, at this topic, like are some things that are not in the plain view, something that we should really consider when talking about tech for social good, like tech in general, for example, uh, safety uh or all kind of things that can impact the things that we are uh, trying to to solve through technology stefan if you are talking i cannot hear. yeah i was muted yeah sorry <laughs> uh, there's just some, something short that i would add uh, i think it's not in plain view as you mentioned so um in healthcare one of the most scarce resources and this is not maybe that talked about is actually uh, the the human resource so the person that's actually uh having to do the diagnosis the person that's actually the caretaker for the patient uh we talk a lot about antibiotics medicine vaccines so on and so forth but there's actually worldwide i think uh <laughs> the shortage of specialists in in healthcare um so I think that at least in healthcare, trying to help the specialists that already exist, as, as well as try to train more specialists that can work in healthcare, um, is a point that needs to be addressed. Uh, and that would definitely bring social good at the end of the day, because it would help uh, more people to get access to, to better treatment, as, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning uh, of, of today's panel. Thank you very much. And Radu, if you have something to, to complete on this. Yeah, we're just you know, talking about things that are you know, we don't see or we ignore, although you would say they are not in plain view, but I think they are pretty much in plain view. We're, we're just not used to... To see them. To see <laughs> them, yeah, that's right. Uh, and I'm starting from... Uh, we at TechSoup, TechSoup Global, we did a survey last year about technology among nonprofits with a focus on data, but uh, it had also very general questions and also very specific on data. And we got answers from about 12,000 nonprofits, large and small, all kinds of nonprofits in 143 uh, states around the world. And one of the things that they reported was that for the past two years, about 55% of them, so more than half of them, reported seeing increasing technology costs. This was not the result of a strategic decision to invest more in technology. They just had seen their tech costs going up year by year. And 66% of them expect for the next two years their costs to go higher. Well, you know, simple observations in looking at your monthly or yearly costs, uh, operational expenses, mind you, not capital expenses. So uh, if these trends, I mean, it's large enough a, a sample to, to be statistically relevant. And I think that's actually very true. This is happening all over from, from a, a, a normal household to large enterprises, to SMBs, to non-profits. Yes, our costs, our expenditure with technology is growing. It's growing. And there's nothing to be scared of. It's just that we need to if <laughs> to put our resources where and, and to realign our priorities. If we rely more and more on digital tools and services on, on this hybrid way of working, 
then we also should back it up with resources. And coming back to the nonprofit world, I'm hoping that this blind spot stops being so blind and that the whole ecosystem around nonprofits and around uh, you know, social good uh, starts to understand that more resources will need to go into technology, even if they are not for profit, uh, used not for profit. And one more point, uh, we should also normalize in the nonprofit world working with third party providers. I mean, we just need to face it that some things are beyond our expertise. So I'm, I'm, I'm very tired of seeing nonprofits working with all kinds of improvisation and makeshift solutions for which they pay, but then they are cheap in hiring, you know, third party providers, IT people. And that's also been a very uh, a taboo in our sector. Like, oh, I cannot afford to pay those people, and I can I don't understand what they mean. And I want to I want to uh, commend uh, Olivia for what she said. Yes, we do have a, a translation problem, but there's a role for that, as far as I know. In the for-profit world, you have the business analyst or the you know the solution architects, somebody who's able to listen, listen to plain NGO you know, plain talk, plain speak, and translate it into technical requirements. And I'll tell you one more thing. These need to, this, this sort of collaboration is to be normalized on the long run. It's not just a one time, you know, we get together over one weekend and we do a hackathon with some volunteers and then we go our separate ways. No, we need to be able to work long term and have some sort of, I will even say joint, joint ownership over these uh, social good projects. So we cannot do it without the tech people anymore. You know, I mean, yes, NGO people are nice and good, but in the, in the end, you know, <laughs> the, the modern world developed by specialization. And that's done when everybody does what they are best at. So yeah, and you cannot rely on volunteers that also needs funds so i'm hoping there are some donors online here and we're, we're starting to normalize this idea we need more <laughs> if, we need more money to flow into this and you know thank you for your refurbished computers but no they just won't do the job <laughs> thank you thank you radu i think it's, it's a very important point and i ho do hope there are donors around here to to listen to our discussion i don't know what happened to the time it says uh, we are already discussing for 56 minutes so uh i will try a little bit to wrap it up so i will have two questions for each of you we'll make a round table so uh the first one is i will ask each of you to choose that area uh, in Romanian society that you think needs the most uh, at this point, the intervention of tech. So pick only one, please. I know it's difficult. Uh, and the second thing that I will ask each of you to answer is that uh, to complete the sentence, I bet that in five years, what will happen to tech for social good? So I will answer first uh, in order to, to be in the same exercise as you, not to be the uh, moderator that only ask uh, hard questions and not the answers to them. So for me, I think education, it's uh, that area where we have to bring tech closer to what we are doing on a, on a daily basis. And I'm sure that in five years, this conversation will bring to the table more people, uh, even more than the ones that are here tonight or are around this topic, because I think this is a movement. I think uh, business for profit is not uh, something that is happening anymore or it's going to decrease. Um, and I will pass the microphone to Olivia. So what area needs the most uh, intervention from tech? at this point? Uh, I think I'm going to address not a topic, not a, an area, but a layer. I think we need to start ensuring that we have basic public, and here I mean both NGOs and public institutions, digital services, uh, before we start building anything else in any of the key areas or we need 
reform uh, like yesterday. And it, I think it's really important to actually build the fundamentals for this because otherwise we're not going to have data, we're not going to be able to make any data-driven decisions, we're not going to be able to make any kind of progress if we don't start building the foundation of future development. And I bet that in five years, Tech for Social Good will be um, will be a lot about uh, community. I do strongly believe that the new generation that is coming right after us is way more socially um, aware than we are, than we were in, because we still follow a bit of the um, educational patterns uh, that we unfortunately um, managed to, to uh, inherit from our educational system. And I think we will look into a lot of circular economy, into maybe a bit of, um, of, of community um, approach in terms of both uh, public services and NGO work. I think we're looking at a more collaborative future at this moment in time. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Radu? Uh, yeah, I'm right there with Olivia. Uh, one one area, public services, government, local, central, it needed this like yesterday or I don't know, five years ago. And if it's if it's not happening, we'll just be, you know, wonderful minds and wonderful people and entrepreneurs doing wonderfully digital things in an analog prison. And when I say analog, it's paper and dosar kushina. Sorry, we'll translate this for our... Uh, I think it's better in Romania. Yes. It has the symbolism, yeah. Uh, and uh, in five years... Ooh, let me be, try to be positive. <laughs> yeah, I think in five years, we'll see more and more of the, you know, the, the kids, the Gen Z, coming, coming up as, you know... Uh, customers, citizens, partners, employees, uh, and their reality is already a, a, a hybrid one. So I think we'll get to a, a critical mass of active actors in society for which life without digital is unconceivable. And that will be the showdown. So if we, if we haven't reformed until then, I don't know, I, I guess we'll just see them gone. Migrate. Thank you, Radu. Stefan? Yeah, um, I think that uh, I still think that tech has to be implemented in healthcare. Uh, so I'm going to go with healthcare for, for the domain um, just because the context is also uh, kind of asking for it um, and requiring it. And I think that in five years from now, tech for social good would be will be a trend. I think that right now startups are much more of a trend than five years ago, um, which is basically where when we started, we kind of started with the trend of startups in in Romania, uh, innovation labs, accelerator, many other programs. Um, so I think that in the next five years, startups are going to become much more of a trend. And there's going to be a trend within a trend, and this new trend will be tech for social, social good. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, Sebastian? Well, all the other speakers actually said, uh, said it uh, uh, better, let's say. But I would like to add here also that transparency is, uh, is very, very important, especially in the public sector. And I see it... Uh, in a high level of urgency right now to address the lack of transparency in the public sector. And of course, that could be done using blockchain. However, that could be done by um, taking more um, strong steps towards uh, being more transparent, not only by using technology. Uh, but that area is very important, public sector, and uh, as it was mentioned already, especially in healthcare. Now, what I see, I bet in five years that, um, of course, blockchain will no longer be seen as a way to make a quick buck, or at least I hope. Uh, but the way uh, governments may shape their policies based on transparency, trust, and truth. And we are, are already seeing this in the World Economic Forum and the OECD uh, Blockchain Policy Forum that 
this topic is getting more and more traction to add transparency and trust using blockchains. And I bet in five years this will um, this will be a common nominator for governments and for our society. Thank you very much for the three T, transparency, trust and truth. I wrote them uh, on my paper. Also, thank you very much for, uh, for your time. I really hope uh, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship uh, between uh, technology and uh, NGOs and people working in, uh, in both sectors. I see Ciprian is still here. Uh, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm always here. So thank you very much for this discussion. I hope we'll continue it uh, in this framework or outside of it. And uh, I really hope we trust each other that uh, we all want the same thing in order to, to do things together and create bridges between uh, NGO sector and the tech and to put our resources together for the world we all want to, to live in. So thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And uh, I'm not, I don't necessarily have a question, but I have a, a comment. I think Stefan said something like, you know, uh, NGOs should go to whatever startup pitches and, and uh, startups should, should go to, I don't know, NGO forums or something like that. Um, and I think the reason of why we would do that is critical because to some extent now for many NGOs, um, the reason why they interact with startups is to get something out of them. What, he, what can you give me? It, it's less about what can we build together, but more about what can you give me? Can you be, give me some guy that can, can uh, uh, design something for me? Or, you know, I need some free software, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, when uh, it should be most likely about how what can we co-design and co-build together? Uh, because some have types of resources that others don't. Um, and contrary to what some might think, startups and companies don't really have that much money uh, to spare. Uh, so it's not about charity and, and donation, but more about uh, co-creation. Now, after these very nice buzzwords, um, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone again for taking the time. Um, and uh, let's not forget what happens also tomorrow, Tuesday, November 16. We go from introduction to sustainability and foresight to a, a session um, on sustainable investment futures. We talk about genomic revolutions um, with Mircea Iliescu from University of Cambridge. Um, then we have Cornela Marie and Dimitris Lamparos uh, on Tech for the Blind. I was speaking of how technology right, uh, can do that. Um, and we end with, with two sessions in Romanian um, about sustainable business making and sustainable finance. Um, one uh, is without the other, um, to some extent, uh, pointless. Now, um, I want to ask you, I know we're over the, the time and I'm the timekeeper, but uh, I want to ask you to give uh, from one to five a grade, let's call it, a number for how you see the, let's pick the Romanian um, uh, economy in the next three years. So one is your you know, uh, pessimistic and five, you're optimistic. And what's in between, you know, you get the point. So Romanian economy by 2024, um, Stefan? Um, yeah, I think uh, I will give it a three. Three, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just because uh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm pessimistic in general. And also I think that things could be moving much faster. Um, and I think that it's up to us, all of us, to get things moving much faster. Good. Sebastian, one to five. Of course, I would say six, right? Because course, <laughs> I'm an optimist. optimist in the room. <laughs> so <laughs> it must be six or more. Uh, because first of all, we are all here, right? And we're going to still be here in the next five years or so. So uh, not only us, but uh, all the others that we may impact or uh, convince that this country actually deserves a lot better than what, what is happening right now or what it was, what happened in the last 30 years or so. 
So um, I would say it, definitely okay. five. It's a, it's a five. Okay, let's go to Olivia. Olivia from Romania. Uh, uh, five points or uh, less? <laughs> is, is, is this the Eurovision contest? Um, do we also do decimals? Because I'm around the 3.75, somewhere around there in five years' time. I have better perspective for 10 years' time, but I'll stick to 3.5 3. for this moment. Uh, Alina, what is the Romanian Business Leaders uh, Association? Uh, say i will keep uh, the middle i will say also three to be balanced because it's also i'm not i'm frustrated with everything that's happening but uh, i get power from this kind of discussions and from this kind of people that i'm meeting so three three at this point three and the final uh grade uh from uh, radu well, I would answer with a, you know, a, a non non digit, but with a word. No, it, the answer is depends. <laughs> de de depends on, on some guys who are probably working hard now at uh, making plans for coalitions, or I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I see Romania as a as a you know I love automobiles as a car that's pushing forward with forward with the handbrake on. So honestly, I, I I am confident in in uh, in the private sector. I think part of it is performing way too well to be stopped. But there is this handbrake on, and it has to do with again public services, though some obsolete ways. So on the on the you know all all in all on the average, I think we're somewhere around three, maybe. 2.75 going three. I'm also this pessimistic, but with an adagio, it could have been so much better. And it could have been so much worse as well. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. We could have had top comrade Nikolai Ceausescu still ruling. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you all so much. See you tomorrow uh, morning from 10, uh, second part of the introduction to sustainability course. Have a lovely evening.